besides still waters by robert shackley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. When people talk about getting away from it all, they're usually thinking about our great open spaces out west, but to science fiction writers, that would be practically in the heart of Times Square. When a man of the future wants solitude, he picks a slab of rock floating in space four light years east of Andromeda. Here is a gentle little story about a man who sought the solitude of such a location. And who did he take along for company? None other than Charles, the robot. Mark Rogers was a prospector, and he went to the asteroid belt looking for radioactives and rare metals. He searched for years, never finding much, hopping from fragment to fragment. After a time he settled on a slab of rock, half a mile thick. Rogers had been born old, and he didn't age much past a point. His face was white with the pallor of space, and his hands shook a little. He called his slap of rock Maria, after no girl he had ever known. He made a little strike, enough to equip Marta with an air pump at his shack, a few tons of dirt and some water tanks, and a robot. Then he settled back and watched the stars. The robot he bought was a standard model all-around worker, with built-in memory and a thirty-word vocabulary. Mark added to that bit by bit. He was something of a tinkerer, and he enjoyed adapting his environment to himself. At first, all the robot could say was, Yes, sir, and no, sir. He could state simple problems. The air pump is laboring, sir. The corn is budding, sir. He could perform a satisfactory salutation. Good morning, sir. Mark changed that. He eliminated the sirs from the robot's vocabulary, Equality was the rule on Mark's hunk of rock. Then he dubbed the robot Charles, after a father he had never known. As the years passed, the air pump began to labor a little, as it converted the oxygen in the planetoid's rock into breathable atmosphere. The air seeped into space, and the pump worked a little harder, supplying more. The crops continued to grow on the tamed black dirt of the planetoid. Looking up, Mark could see the sheer blackness of the river of space the floating points of the stars, around him, under him. Overhead, masses of rock drifted, and sometimes the starlight glinted from their black sides. Occasionally, Mark caught a glimpse of Mars or Jupiter. Once he thought he saw Earth. Mark began to tape new responses into Charles. He added simple responses to cue words. When he said, How does it look? Charles would answer, Pretty good, I guess. At first, the answers were what Mark had been answering himself in the long dialogue held over the years. But slowly, he began to build a new personality into Charles. Mark had always been suspicious and scornful of women, but for some reason he didn't tape the same suspicion into Charles. Charles' outlook was quite different. What do you think of girls? Mark would ask, sitting on a packaging case outside the shack after the chores were done. Oh, I don't know. You have to find the right one, the robot would reply dutifully, repeating what had been put in its tape. I never saw a good one yet, Mark would say. Well, that's not fair. Perhaps you didn't look long enough. There's a girl in the world for every man. You're a romantic, Mark would say scornfully. The robot would pause, a build-in pause, and chuckle a carefully constructed chuckle. I dreamed of a girl named Marta once, Charles would say. Maybe if I would have looked, I would have found her. Then it would be bedtime. Or perhaps Mark would want more conversation. What do you think of girls? He would ask again. And the discussion would follow its same course. Charles grew old. His limbs lost their flexibility. And some of his wiring started to corrode. Mark would spend hours keeping the robot in repair. You are getting rusty, he would cackle. You're not so young yourself, Charles would reply. He had an answer for almost everything. Nothing involved, but an answer. It was always night on Marta, but Mark broke up his time into mornings, afternoons, and evenings. Their life followed a simple routine. 
breakfast from vegetables in Mark's canned store. Then the robot would work in the fields, and the plants grew used to his touch. Mark would repair the pump, check the water supply, and straighten up the immaculate shack. Lunch and the robot's chores were usually finished. The two would sit in the packaging case and watch the stars. They would talk until supper, and sometimes late into the endless night. In time, Mark built more complicated conversations into Charles. He couldn't give the robot free choice, of course, but he managed a pretty close approximation of it. Slowly, Charles's personality emerged, but it was strikingly different from Mark's. Where Mark was querulous, Charles was calm. Mark was sardonic. Charles was naive. Mark was a cynic. Charles was an idealist. Mark was often sad. Charles was forever content. And in time, Mark forgot he had built the answers into Charles. He accepted the robot as a friend, of about his own age, a friend of long years standing. The thing I don't understand, Mark would say, is why a man like you would want to live here. I mean, it's all right for me. No one cares about me. And I never give much of a damn about anyone. But why you? Here I have the whole world, Charles would reply. Where on earth I had to share with billions. I have the stars, bigger and brighter than on earth. I have all space around me, close, like still waters. And I have you, Mark. Now don't go getting sentimental on me. I'm not. Friendship counts. Love was lost long ago, Mark. The love of a girl named Marta, who neither of us ever met. And that's a pity. But friendship remains. And the eternal night. You're a bloody poet, Mark would say half admiringly. A poor poet. Time passed unnoticed by the stars. When the air pump hissed and clanked and leaked, Mark was fixing it constantly. But the air of Marta became increasingly rare. Although Charles labored in the fields, the crops, deprived of sufficient air, died. Mark was tired now, and barely able to crawl around, even without the grip of gravity. He stayed in his bunk most of the time. Charles fed him as best as he could, moving on rusty, creaking limbs. What do you think of girls? I never saw a good one yet. Well, that's not fair. Mark was too tired to see the end coming, and Charles wasn't interested. But the end was on its way. The air pump threatened to give out momentarily. There hadn't been any food for days. But why you? Gasping in the escaping air, strangling. Here I have the whole world. Don't get sentimental. And the love of a girl named Marta. From his bunk, Mark saw the stars from the last time. Big, bigger than ever. Endlessly floating in the still waters of space stars mark said yes the sun shall shine as now a bloody poet a poor poet and girls i dreamed of a girl named mara once maybe if what do you think of girls and stars and earth and it was bedtime this time forever Charles stood beside the body of his friend. He felt for a pulse once, and allowed the withered hand to fall. He walked to a corner of the shack and turned off the tired air pump. The tape that Mark had prepared had a few cracked inches left to run. I hope he finds his Marta. The robot croaked, and then the tape broke. His rusted limbs would not bend, and he stood frozen, staring back at the naked stars. Then he bowed his head. The Lord is my shepherd, Charles said. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me. End of Besides Still Waters
Pipe of Peace by James McKimmy, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Ehrman Pipe of Peace by James McKimmy, Jr. The farmer refused to work. His wife, a short, thin woman with worried eyes, watched him while he sat before the kitchen table. He was thin, too, like his wife, but tall and tough-skinned. His face with its leather look was immobile. Why? asked his wife. Good reasons, the farmer said. He poured yellow cream into a cup of coffee. He let the cup sit on the table. Henry, said the woman, as though she were really speaking to someone else. She walked around the kitchen in quick, aimless bird steps. "'My right,' said Henry. He lifted his cup, finely tasting. "'We'll starve. Not likely. Not until everybody else does, anyway.' The woman circled the room and came back to her husband. Her eyes winked, and there were lines between them. Her fingers clutched the edge of the table. "'You've gone crazy,' she said, as though it were a half-question, a half-pronouncement. The farmer was relaxing now, leaning back in his chair. Might have, might have at that. Why? she asked. The farmer turned his coffee cup carefully. Thing to do is all, each man in his own turn. This is my turn. The woman watched him for a long time, then she sat down on a chair beside the table. The quick, nervous movement was gone out of her. She sat like a frozen sparrow. The farmer looked up and grinned. Feels good just to sit here. Does well for the back and the arms. Been working too hard. Henry, said the woman. The farmer tasted his coffee again. He put the cup on the table and leaned back, tapping his brown fingers. Just in time, I'd say. Waited any longer. Would have done any good. Another few years, farmer wouldn't mean anything. The woman watched him, her eyes frightened, as though he might suddenly gnash his teeth or leap in the air. Pretty soon, the farmer said, they'd have it all mechanical, couldn't stop anything now. He said, wife smiling, we can stop it all. Henry, go out to the fields, the woman said. No, Henry said, standing, stretching his thin, hard body. I won't go out to the fields, neither will August Brown, nor Clyde Briggs, nor Alfred Swanson. None of us, anywhere. Not until the food's been stopped long enough for people to wake up. The farmer looked out of the kitchen window beyond his tractor and the cow barn and the windmill. He looked at rows of strong corn, shivering their soft silk in the morning breeze. We'll stop the corn, stop the wheat, stop the cattle, the hogs, the chickens. You can't. I can't. But all of us together can. No sense, the woman said, wagging her head. No sense. It's sense, all right. Best sense we've ever had. Can't use any army with no stomach. Old as the earth. Can't fight without food. Takes food to run a war. You'll starve the two of us. That's all you'll do. Nobody else will stop work. The farmer turned to his wife. Yes, they will. Everywhere a farmer is the same. He works the land, he reads the papers, he votes, he listens to the radio, he watches the television. Mostly he works the land, alone with his own thoughts and ideas. He isn't any different in Maine than he is in Oregon. We've all stopped work. Now, this morning. Well, how about those across the ocean? Are they stopping too? They're not going to feed up their soldiers. To kill us if we don't starve first, to... They stop, too. A farmer's a farmer, like a leaf on a tree. No matter on what tree, what country, on whose land, a leaf is a leaf. A farmer's the same. A farmer's a farmer. It won't work, the woman said dully. Yes, it will. They'll make you work. How? It's our own property. Well, they'll take it away from you. Well, who'll work it then? The woman rocked in her chair, her mouth quivering. They'll get somebody. The farmer shook his head. Too many people doing other things, like making shells and guns, like sitting in foxholes or flying planes. 
The woman sat rocking, her hands together in her lap. It won't work, she repeated. It'll work, said the farmer. Right now it'll work. Yes, we've got milkers and shuckers, and we've got hatchers for the chickens. We've got tractors and combines and threshing machines. They're all mechanical, all right, but we don't have mechanical farmers yet. The pumps, the tractors, the milkers don't work by themselves. In time, maybe, but not now. We're still ahead of them at that. It'll work. Go out to the fields, Henry his wife said, her voice like the sound of a worn phonographic record. Nope, said the farmer, taking a pipe from his overalls. I think instead I'll just sit in the sun and watch the corn, watch the birds on top of the barn, maybe. I'll fill my pipe and sit there and smoke and watch. When I get sleepy, I'll, I'll sleep. After a while, I might go see August Brown or Clyde Briggins, or maybe Alfred Swanson. We'll sit and talk about pleasant things, peaceful things. We'll wait. The farmer put the pipe between his teeth and walked to the door. He put on his straw hat, buttoned the sleeves of his blue shirt, and stepped outside. His wife sat at the table, staring at nothing in the room. The farmer walked across the barnyard, listened to the sound of the chickens and the sound of the breeze going through the corn near the barn. He sat upon an old tree stump and filled his pipe with tobacco. He lit the pipe, cupping his hands, and sat there, smoking, the smoke spiraling up into the bright, warm air. He took his pipe from his teeth and looked at it. Pipe of peace, he said, laughing inside himself. The breeze was soft and the sun warm on his back. He sat there, smoking, feeling the quiet of the morning, the peace of the great sky above. He had no time to stand or to take his pipe from his mouth when the two men crossed the yard and lifted him up by the arms. He dropped the pipe while he was dragged past the house to the road beyond. He had no time to yell or scream before his hat was swept from his head, the overalls and the blue shirt stripped from his body. He had not even thought about what it was that had happened before he was thrust inside a white truck with strong steel sides and with grilled windows like those of a cell. He was just sitting there, in the truck, without his clothes, speeding away with August Brown and Clyde Briggins and Alfred Swanson. Outside, the sun was warm upon the earth. Chickens clucked in their pens while birds fluttered about the top of the barn. A pig squealed. The corn rustled, and beside the farmhouse on the ground lay a pipe. Its tobacco spilled. The last of its smoke swirling out of its bowl into the air, disappearing. The woman sat in the kitchen of the farmhouse and turned her head when the door opened. She widened her eyes and caught at her throat with her hand. The sun through the doorway shone down on metallic hands and a metallic face, gleaming on the surface which the straw hat and the overalls and the blue shirt didn't hide. The door snapped shut and there was the sound of a heavy metal footsteps against the kitchen floor. The woman pressed against her chair. "'Who are you?' she screamed. "'Henry,' said the mechanical thing. End of Pipe of Peace by James McKimmy, Jr. Recording by Thomas Ehrman What's he doing in there? By Fritz Lieber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Ehrman. What's He Doing in There? By Fritz Lieber. The professor was congratulating Earth's first visitor from another planet on his wisdom in getting in touch with a cultural anthropologist before contacting any other scientists, or governments, God forbid, and in learning English from radio and TV before landing from his orbit-parked rocket, when the Martian stood up and said hesitantly, Excuse me, please, but where is it? That baffled the professor, and the Martian seemed to grow anxious. 
at least his long mouth curved upward, and he had earlier explained that it curling downward was his smile, and he repeated, Please, where is it? He was surprisingly humanoid in most respects, but his complexion was textured so like the rich, dark armchair he'd just been occupying that the professor's pinstriped gray suit, which he had eagerly consented to wear, seemed an arbitrary interruption between him and the chair, a sort of Mother Hubbard dress on a phantom conjured from its leather. The professor's wife, always a perceptive hostess, came to her husband's rescue by saying with equal rapidity, Top of the stairs, end of the hall, last door. The Martian's mouth curled happily downward, and he said, Thank you very much, and was off. Comprehension burst on the professor. He caught up with his guest at the foot of the stairs. Here, I'll show you the way, he said. No, I can find it myself, thank you, the Martian assured him. Something rather final in the Martian's tone made the professor desist, and after watching his visitor sway up the stairs with an almost hypnotic, softly jogging movement, he rejoined his wife in the study, saying wonderly, Who'd have thought it? By George! Function taboos as strict as our own. I'm glad some of your professional visitors maintain them, his wife said darkly. But this one's from Mars, darling, and to find out he's, well, similar in an aspect of life is as thrilling as a discovery that water has burned hydrogen. When I think of the day not far distant when I'll put his entries in the cross-cultural index, he was still rhapsodizing when the professor's little son raced in. Pop! The Martian's gone to the bathroom! Hush, dear. Manners. Now it's perfectly natural, darling, that the boy should notice and be excited. Yes, son, the Martian's not so very different from us. Oh, certainly, the professor's wife said with a trace of bitterness. I don't imagine his turquoise complexion will cause any comment at all when you bring him home to a faculty reception. They'll just figure he's had a hard night, and that he got that baby elephant nose sniffing around for assistant professorships. Really, darling, he probably thinks of our noses as disagreeably amputated and paralyzed. Well, anyway, Pop, he's in the bathroom. I followed him when he squiggled upstairs. Now, son, you shouldn't have done that. He's on a strange planet, and it might make him nervous if he thought he was being spied on. We must show him every courtesy. By George, I can't wait to discuss these things with Ackerley Ramsbottom. When I think of how much more this encounter has to give the anthropologist than even the psychiatrist or astronomer. He was still going strong on his second rhapsody when he was interrupted by another high-speed entrance. It was the professor's cultish daughter. Mom? Pop? The Martians? Hush, dear, we know. The professor's cultish daughter regained her adolescent poise, which was considerable. Well, he's still in there, she said. I just tried the door, and it was locked. I'm glad it was, the professor said, while his wife added, Yes, we can't be sure what... and caught herself. Really, dear, that was very bad manners. Well, I thought he'd come downstairs long ago, her daughter explained. He's been in there an awfully long time. It must have been a half hour ago when I saw him guy and gimble upstairs in that real gone way he has, with Nosy here following him. The professor's coltish daughter was currently soaking up both Jive and Alice. When the professor checked his wristwatch, his expression grew troubled. By George, he is taking his time. Though, of course, we don't know how much time Martians... I wonder. I listened for a while, Pop, his son volunteered. He was running the water a lot. Running the water, eh? Well, we know Mars is a water-starved planet. I suppose that in the presence of unlimited water, he might be seized by a kind of madness, and... But he seemed so well-adjusted. Then his wife spoke, voicing all of her thoughts. Her outlook on life gave her a naturally sepulchral voice. What's he doing in there? Twenty minutes and at least as many fantastic suggestions later, the professor glanced again at his watch and nerved himself for action. Motioning his family aside, he mounted the stairs and tiptoed down the hall. He paused only once to shake his head and munder under his breath. 
by George. I wish I had Frenchern or von Gottschalk here. They're a shade better than I am on intercultural contracts, especially taboo breakings and affronts. His family followed him at a short distance. The professor stopped in front of the bathroom door. Everything was quiet as death. He listened for a minute and then rapped measuredly, steadying his hand by clutching its wrist with the other. There was a faint splashing, but no other sound. Another minute passed. The professor rapped again. Now there was no response at all. He very gingerly tried the knob. The door was still locked. When they had retreated to the stairs, it was the professor's wife who once more voiced their thoughts. This time her voice carried overtones of supernatural horror. What's he doing in there? He may be dead or dying, the professor's cultish daughter suggested briskly. Maybe we ought to call the fire department like they did for old Miss Frisby. The professor winced. I'm afraid you haven't visualized the complications, dear, he said gently. No one but ourselves knows that the Martian is on Earth, or has even the slightest inkling that interplanetary travel has been achieved. Whatever we do, it will have to be on our own. But to break in on a creature engaged in... Well, we don't know what primal private activity is against all anthropological practice. Still, dying's a primal activity, his daughter said crisply. So is ritual bathing before mass murder, his wife added. Please. Still, as I was about to say, we do have the moral duty to succor him if you all too reasonably suggest he's been incapacitated by a, a germ or virus or more likely by some simple environmental factor such as Earth's greater gravity. Tell you what, Pop, I can look in the bathroom window and see what he's doing. All I have to do is crawl out my bedroom window and along the gutter a little ways. It's safe as houses. The professor's question, beginning with, Son, how do you know... died unuttered as he refused to notice the words his daughter was voicing silently at her brother. He glanced at his wife's sardonically composed face, thought once more of the fire department and of other and larger, even more jealous or... Would it be skeptical government agencies? And clutched at the straw offered him. Ten minutes later, he was quite unnecessarily assisting his son back through the bedroom window. Gee, Pop, I couldn't see a sign of him. That's why I took so long. Hey, Pop, don't look so scared. He's in there, sure enough. It's just that the bathtub's under the window, and you have to get real close up to see into it. The Martian's taking a bath? Yep. Got it full up and just the end of his little old schnozzle sticking out. Your suit, Pop, was hanging on the door. The one word the professor's wife spoke was like a death knell. Drowned. No, Ma, I don't think so. His schnozzle was opening and closing regular-like. Maybe he's a shapeshifter, the professor's cultish daughter said in a burst of evil fantasy. Maybe he softens in water and thins out after a while until he's like an eel. Then he'll go exploring through the sewer pipes. Wouldn't it be funny if he went under the street and knocked on the stopper from underneath and crawled into the bathtub with President Rexford or Miss President Rexford or maybe right into the middle of one of Janie Rexford's Oh, I'm so sexy bubble baths. Please. The professor put his hand to his eyebrows and kept it there cuddling the elbow in his other hand. "'Well, have you thought of something?' the professor's wife asked him after a bit. "'What are you going to do?' The professor dropped his hand and blinked his eyes hard and took a deep breath. "'Telegraph Fenchurch and Ackerley Ramsbottom and then break in,' he said in a resigned voice, into which, nevertheless, a note of hope seemed to have come from. First, however, I'm going to wait until morning. And he sat down cross-legged in the hall a few yards from the bathroom door and folded his arms. So the long vigil commenced. The professor's family shared it, and he offered no objection. 
Other and sterner men, he told himself, might claim to be able successfully to order their children to go to bed when there was a Martian locked in the bathroom, but he would like to see them faced with the situation. Finally, dawn began to seep from the bedrooms. When the bulb in the hall had grown quite dim, the professor unfolded his arms. Just then, there was a loud splashing in the bathroom. The professor's family looked toward the door. The splashing stopped, and they heard the Martian moving around. Then the door opened, and the Martian appeared in the professor's gray pinstripe suit. His mouth curled sharply downward in a broad alien smile as he saw the professor. "'Good morning!' the Martian said happily. "'I never slept better in my life, even in my own little wet bed back on Mars.' He looked around more closely, and his mouth straightened. "'But where did you all sleep?' he asked. "'Don't tell me you stayed dry all night. You didn't give up your only bed to me.' His mouth curled upward in misery. "'Oh, dear,' he said. "'I'm afraid I've made a mistake somehow.' Yet I don't understand how. Before I studied you, I didn't know what your sleeping habits would be, but then question was answered for me. In fact, it looked so reassuringly homelike when I saw those brief TV scenes of your females ready for sleep in their little tubs. Of course, on Mars, only the fortunate can always be sure of sleeping wet. But here, with your abundance of water, I thought there would be wet beds for all. He paused. It's true I had some doubts last night, wondering if I'd used the right words and all, but then when you rapped good night to me, I splashed the sentiment back at you and you went to sleep in a wink. But I'm afraid that somewhere I've blundered and... No, no, dear chap, the professor managed to say. He had been waving his hand in a gentle circle for some time in token that he wanted to interrupt. Everything is quite all right. It's true we stayed up all night, but please consider that as a watch. An honor guard by George, which we kept to indicate our esteem. End of What's He Doing in There by Fritz Lieber Read by Thomas Ehrman The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Bounds. The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick. It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. As yet, I haven't done anything about it. I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe it's even under control. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning the pages of a paperback book someone had left on the bus, when I came across the reference that first put me on the trail. For a moment I didn't respond. It took some time for the full import to sink in. After I'd comprehended, it seemed odd I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties not indigenous to Earth, a species I hasten to point out customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became transparent in the face of the following observations by the author. It was at once obvious the author knew everything, knew everything and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble remembering it even now, read, His eyes slowly roved across the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air, not over the surface. Rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. Later, the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person to person. <laughs> there it was in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded and my breath 
choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race, obviously non-terrestrial. Yet, to the characters in the book, it was perfectly natural, which suggested they belonged to the same species. And the author? A, a slow suspicion burned in my mind. The author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Uh, evidently, he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal his knowledge. The story continued. Presently, his eyes fastened on Julia. Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this, I sighed with relief. They weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly, his eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! But here the girl turned and stomped off, and the matter ended. I, I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. "'What's wrong, dear?' my wife asked. <laughs> "'I I, 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 couldn't tell her. <laughs> "'Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. "'I had to keep it to myself.' N "'Nothing,' I gasped. "'I leapt up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. "'In the garage, I continued reading. "'There was more. "'Trembling, I read the next revealing passage.' He put his arm around Julia. Presently, she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. Maybe it was left standing upright in the corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. In any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will, eyes, arms, and maybe more, without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy at this point. Obviously, they were simple beings, unicellular, some sort of primitive, single-celled things, beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know. I read on, and came to this incredible revelation tossed off coolly by the author without the faintest tremor. Outside the movie theater, we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the cafe for dinner. Binary fission, obviously, splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably each lower half went to the cafe, it being farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, my hands shaking. I had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney has lost his head again. Which was followed by, and Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was soon described as totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julia, whom I had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life form, similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julia had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the organ was, but I didn't really care. It was evident Julia had gone right on living in her usual manner, like all the others in the book without heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera, dividing up in two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereupon she gave him her hand. Ah, oh, I sickened. The rascal now had her hand as well as her heart. I shudder to think what he's done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had to start dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leapt to my feet but not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. Her eyes followed him all the way down the road and across the meadow. <laughs> I, I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house, as if the accursed things were following me. My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I, I joined them and played with frantic fervor, brow feverish, teeth chattering, I, I had had enough of the thing. I want to hear no more about it. Let them come on, let them invade Earth. I don't want to get mixed up in it. I have absolutely no stomach for it. 
End of The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick Prelude to Space by Robert W. Hasseltine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prelude to Space by Robert W. Hasseltine You're certain to be included in a survey at one time or another. However, there's one you may not recognize as such. Chances are, it will be more important than you imagine. It could be man's prelude to space. I was climbing the steep side of a central Wisconsin hill, holding my bow away from my body for balance, when I first saw the stranger. He sat on a stump at the crest and watched me struggle up. As I drew nearer, I panted out a greeting and received his cheerful, hi, in return. When I finally reached the top, I threw myself on the ground and began catching my breath. He did not say anything at first, just looked at the bow and the quiver of arrows at my back. Finally, he said, May I look at it? And reached for the bow. I handed it to him. He examined it carefully and returned it. Beautiful workmanship. Is that all you use? He asked. I never cared much for guns, I answered. I've always thought a bow gave the animal more of an even chance for his life. We talked then on the various aspects of hunting and how the crisp fall air seemed to make the deer seem closer than during the heat of summer. While we talked, I tried to place the reason he disturbed me, but I couldn't seem to do it. He was dressed in an old plaid shirt and dungarees, and his blond hair wasn't many shades removed from my own straw thatch. But there was something odd about him that I couldn't quite find. Perhaps it's the cloth. His words surprised me. You see, it hasn't been discovered on this planet as yet. My face must have shown astonishment, because he went on in the same vein. I admit it's confusing, but it's also true. My clothes weren't made on earth. He chuckled then, deep in his throat. <laughs> I don't blame you for being confused. I know how I would feel if I met an extraterrestrial being before space travel was a reality. I kept staring at him. Finally, I blurted out, What in Sam Hill are you talking about? He leaned forward on the stump, and his face grew earnest. You might say I'm a pole taker. I have to decide certain things from various interviews with individuals I meet. What are you trying to prove? I asked. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you that until I'm finished with the interview. If I told you, your interest in the subject would tend to prejudice your answers. Fair enough. What do you want to ask me? He pulled out a notebook and smiled. These questions may seem a little silly, but I must have straightforward answers to them. Will you go along with me? I nodded my head. Let's see now. If you were the head of a government, and wanted to ascertain whether another country was ready for admission into the United Nations, what would you do? I shrugged. I suppose I would read books and magazines from the country, and possibly have an interview with the heads of the government. After I had collected my data, I could then act upon it. For the sake of argument, suppose the books and other periodicals were written so as to be prejudicial in favor of the government, and the heads also were coloring what they said. I thought for a minute. In that case, I suppose I would secretly place someone inside the country to interview the people and get a first-hand view of the situation. 
Then I would act on his data. He nodded his head. Yes, the people themselves and the conditions they live in will give you the needed data. He turned a page in the book. Now suppose that you wish to know if a certain planet was ready to enter into an organization such as the Galactic Federation. What would you do? I suppose I'd act as I did before, place people inside the various areas of the planet to interview and observe. They would bring back the information needed to ascertain whether they would be an asset or a detriment to the organization. I thought to myself that the question was a trifle silly. After all, hadn't science proved that life couldn't exist on the other planets in our system? He relaxed after I answered, and his smile was brighter than the previous ones. Right, he said. Naturally, we had to learn the language first. But now, a first-hand check can be made. You see, there is a civilization out there. He raised his hand and swept the sky. And we have to check to see if this planet is ready to take its place as an adult civilization with the rest of us. Earth, within a very short time, will be reaching her fingers into space. Once she gets there, she will be eligible to join the Galactic Federation. That's all right, I said. Then we can exchange culture and knowledge with other civilizations. Yes, if you are able to join. But you said that once we reach space, we will be eligible. Look at it this way, he said. The main purpose of the Galactic Federation is to promote peace and understanding among the various planets. Earth would have to be prepared to take its place as just another member and not an important member at that. Earth, you see, is one of the smaller planets, and also would be the latest one to join. In times past, some planets have reached space without being fully prepared for what they would find. They still had internal troubles on their own worlds. We had to place them in quarantine until they reached that degree of civilization where they were ready to live in peace. Now. We check a planet before it reaches space travel stage. We find out the reactions of the inhabitants to certain situations. What sort of situations? I asked. Well, naturally, we want to see their artifacts as an indication as to their achievement. We have to know what the average man thinks of space travel and trade with other planets and their ideas on peace, and their feelings toward their fellow men, all are very important. Actually, when a planet once enters the Federation, the people are the ones who decide on peace and war. So if the majority of the people on a planet are peace-loving, that planet is ready to enter the Federation. But how do you find out all these things? I asked. When a man finds out what you're trying to prove... He may lie because he wants to get into space. His eyes held a mischievous glint as he answered. Simple. The art of telepathy has been highly developed among my race. I have your thoughts on everything I've mentioned. Later, when all the data from thousands of similar interviews is in, it will be evaluated, and the decision made as to whether your world will be allowed to reach space. We have the means of keeping you from it if we decide you aren't yet ready. He stood up, and I followed suit. I must be going now, he sighed. This work keeps me on the run, and I have many more interviews to make. Believe me, it was a pleasure meeting you. I hope we meet again. Later. We shook hands, and he strolled over the hill into the valley. Perhaps I should have followed him, but it wouldn't have done any good, really, because a few moments later I saw something shimmering over the top of the hill. It was big and disc-shaped, 
and shot into the sky with a speed that was unbelievable. I still don't know what to think about him or what we talked about. I'm going to keep watching the papers, though, and hoping he got the right answers. If we reach the moon, I'll know he did. End of Prelude to Space by Robert W. Hasseltine